Hey, Darren Little John here, episode number 37 of the 12 Step Buddhist podcast Psychedelic Sobriety. Now, I did an episode uh, number 36 on the five precepts I vow not to take intoxicants. And I do have um, two more of those to do on the vows and the five uh, Buddhist precepts or the lay vows. I have one in the can on sexual misconduct, and I'm going to be putting that out uh, shortly, probably next week. I do apologize for taking a couple of weeks off. The last episode was 9618, and I had to find a place to live and move, and I did that. So the good news about that is that after about two years of uh, living out of bags and renting rooms, um, I finally have my own place. And I went from having only what would fit in my car, clothes and books, to a fully furnished apartment with all the stuff I got from amazing friends, donations, gifts, the Buy Nothing group on Facebook, which is fantastic if you have nothing or if you have stuff to give away. Or if you need something, just go on to Facebook and check your, uh, your local neighborhood for your Buy Nothing group. Uh, a yard sale from a sober house here in San Diego that had moved, um, had a couple, like a cool desk and a couple of altar, um, well, a couple of bookshelves that I've used uh, for altars and, and my spiritual books. So, yeah, I really outfitted this place. I uh, got a front yard, got my dog, and interesting story. In 2009, Tyson and I had a house with two garages, four dogs, and two cats, a hot tub up in Portland. And when we kind of separated, we gave the cats to um, people with a farm in, um, in, the, or in the Portland area. And I got a call about a month ago from the chip company for the cat. Uh, one of the cats had been found. Somebody found, found them. And I called the lady, and she couldn't keep them and couldn't reach the, uh, the owner that I had given them to. She was kind of... a mentally incompetent or something unable to really communicate about it and wasn't going to get the cat so i uh, had just signed a lease on this place and i I asked my landlord um it's it's a no pets place you know but i I asked them can i possibly get my old cat and they said sure so um i did a gofundme a facebook fundraiser and uh because i I didn't have any cash left after moving in here and yeah i got, got people so people love taking care of animals so I mean, people contributed i had the cat uh, driven down here it's like over 300 dollars to uh, have a guy deliver him door to door but he brought him up and um got my old cat so i'm looking at facebook pictures with, with the cat from 2009 and 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 gizzy my my current dog which was tiffany's dog and tiffany it was the five-year anniversary of her murder um, actually October 9th and um, you know that's a long story but you know she uh, she tried to get sober couldn't do it uh, many times and uh, wound up with the wrong people and got killed and uh, they're all in prison now but you know I got this dog it's my last of four <laughs> it's, it's this old curmudgeon dog and I got this sweet old cat he's about nine he's not that old really as cats go but yeah, they don't really get along perfectly well, but we're all sharing the same space. So I've got an altar in every room, Buddha's on every wall, and I do a lot of spiritual practice here. I did a, did this podcast episode with uh, Tyler, which is uh, coming right up here in a few moments. So I'm happy and excited about it. My life has taken on a, a new, uh, completely new meaning uh, after being basically living out of the car and just driving Uber with the dog in the front seat for two years. It was really pretty brutal. And uh, I'll talk more about all that kind of stuff in my history, but I'm coming up on 21 years sober and I'm still practicing Dharma best I can. My teacher, Shogal Namkai Norbu, has passed away as of the 28th of September. And that's been just a major, major shift in my energy um, and uh, just really deepening my practice, deepening my yoga. I'm writing more books. Hey, you guys, go on to Amazon. These books are inexpensive short reads, two ninety nine for The Yoga of Self-Compassion, uh, The Yoga of Letting Go, which is really powerful work. It's on grief, PTSD, um, 
just transitioning out of suffering. It's really, really good. So check it out. And uh, how to find a spiritual teacher. Uh, I wrote that out. Just people, just there's so much going on with the people and spiritual teachings and taking advantage and just with all this Me Too movement and Bill Cosby and, you know, uh, just comedians and politicians and judges. And it's just crazy how much abuse of power there is. So I wrote that book. That should help you think about it and give you some ideas. Um, but I need reviews on those. So I'll give you free copies of those. Just send me an email, Darren B. Little John, or just go onto my website, the12stepbuddhist.com, and, and sign up on the email uh, form there. And um, I'll give you a free copy if you can give me a review. That would be awesome. Share it on social media. Like and share it. Like and share. Okay, those are my commercials. I do have a contract for the 12 Step Buddhist 10 Year Anniversary Edition, um, which I'm working on next after I finish the third in the Yoga of Transformation series, which is the Yoga of Being a Badass. I'm almost I'm about three quarters of the way th uh, through that one. And that's going to become available in print as well as audio. Um, and then I'm told by my publisher that Simon & Schuster is happening with uh, Compassionate Recovery. They want it, and uh, we'll be putting that out. Uh, it'll be about a year, but uh, I'm going to start working on that, which is a whole new... I'll do some podcasts on it because this is a whole new way of looking at recovery. So hopefully that'll get some traction and be something that people can, can utilize. So, all right, without further ado, here's my friend Tyler talking about the plant medicine and his uh, ideas on r recovery and sobriety. You know, we try to be open-minded and listen to these things. If you're a fundamentalist, 12-step person, maybe you don't like it, um, it's too bad. You gotta think in, outside the box in recovery. Everybody, you know, there's so many people dying, so many people suffering. I've always been, I've been saying this for a decade at least. You know, we have to do everything that we can to help ourselves and each other heal from addictions and trauma. So uh, open your mind, open your heart, and uh, take a listen. And um, listen, hey, if you don't take it from me, listen to Gabor, Gabor Mate. He's got a YouTube out recently. And uh, you know, he takes people down to, I think, Ecuador for the ayahuasca. So, you know, there are things to think about in terms of trying uh, uh, different types of healing modalities. Anyways, I hope you enjoy this one. You can always uh, contact me, uh, DarrenBLittleJohn at gmail.com. Sign up on the uh, website. Check my Instagram, 12 Step Buddhist. And uh, shoot me a note. I'm always happy to talk. If you need any help with anything, just let me know. Okay, here we go with episode 37, Psychedelic Sobriety. Cool. Okay, so welcome to the 12-Step Buddhist Podcast. I'm not sure what episode this is going to be yet because um, I'm putting them in the can and putting them out as we go. Uh, I have the pleasure of inviting my friend Tyler, uh, Tyler Fink, from uh, San Diego here in we have a relationship based on him being a server at my or, or a counter guy basically at my favorite um, breakfast joint Swami's in San Diego and that was how long have we known each other based on that about four years about now. four years yeah <laughs> so so you've seen me go through I've brought in a different old different relationships different women in and out you know different periods of my life so we've always had this like two minute conversation um, or whatever while ordering but um, it, it came out that you, that uh, Tyler was uh, clean, uh, clean and sober at least uh, from heroin, and um, that I was sober, and we became Facebook friends and chatted a little bit. And the reason why I invited him today is because uh, we're talking about a new kind of approach, an alternative. We always on the show always talk about in all my books. We talk about alternative approaches. You know, twelve step being part of it, but not being all of it. And just looking at ways to help people get sober, stay sober, uh, attain spiritual awareness, freedom, growth, and so forth. So the idea here, uh, I think Gabor Mate is really big on this, of, of uh, taking people to, I don't know if it's Ecuador or the Amazon or something, to do ayahuasca. And there's a lot of people apparently doing ayahuasca in uh, sobriety. And it's a kind of an AA faux pas. I've had people on my... Um, reviews of the uh, for the yoga of letting go i had an old time aa guy say on there well he's not sober because he's got cbd and that's a chemical and well i've been talking about cbd for years um you can listen to the other podcast about that but not cbd to get cbd to get high but cbd without any toxicity 
to uh, get into a state of relaxation to treat you know PTSD, sleep disorder. So there's a lot of these alternatives going on, and um, Tyler is uh, well versed in it and is giving a um, lecture uh, coming up pretty soon at one of the um, burner um, kind of after burner local group kind of deals called I think it's called Utopia. Is that right? Correct. In San Diego. So, anyways, I know he's got some expertise on it and, and at least some experience. So, I just want to go ahead and give him the opportunity to talk a little bit about this. So, anyways, welcome again. Thanks for coming. Yeah, Darren. Thank you for having me. And has been interesting. You know. Like it's been four years since we've really known each other now, but most of our interaction has just been like three or four minutes right. here or there. And it's pretty, I'm a friendly guy, so I feel like I can extract a lot within a few minutes of, 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 of seeing somebody on a consistent basis. So it was really cool to, you know, just realize we have that in common, the uh, just our, our, our recovery and our history with addiction and then just you know our different spiritual um beliefs as right. well um i pull from a lot of different beliefs but buddhism is definitely um up there with one of the more umbrella um, um philosophical um explorations that i've tapped into since i've gotten you know through my addiction and well talk, talk a little bit about your history with addiction <laughs> absolutely yeah so i'm, I'm from philadelphia uh, originally, and I, I have st started off with opiates, painkillers in high school, and ended up going down to Florida, uh, South Florida for school, and the whole pain management clinics down there. I was seeing like five different pain management doctors a month, and getting hundreds of pills, and that's where my addiction really took off. Moved back up to Philadelphia after I couldn't handle South Florida anymore, and that's where I got introduced to heroin because it is cheaper and packs more of a punch. Mm. And I was shooting heroin for a good six years in Philadelphia. And I have been through conventional rehabs, um, about five of them, and oh, detoxes. Yeah. I've worked 12 steps quite a few times. Mm. And, you know, I, 12 steps never worked for me. As much as I worked 12 steps, it didn't work for me. And I've noticed that there are quite a few people out there that have the same dilemma when it comes to recovery because I think 12 steps is great and it has its place and it's helped millions of people or tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people. But, you know, it's really been through my experience in conventional rehabs that it's really put out there that AA is really the only way. I right. mean, it's, there's really this underlying like, yeah, keep coming back. You can try smart recovery, right. this and that, keep coming back, um, this underlying kind of sarcastic. Yeah. And, um, for me, it was like, wow, you know, if AA is the only way and it works if you work it, well, I've worked it. I put my working it and it's not working. It's not, and if it's the only way, it's like, that's the ultimate, like, that makes you feel like a failure. Right. That makes I, you feel I, like there's no way you can win. Yeah, I don't know if I can curse on this podcast or you not. Can say whatever you that's want. the ultimate fuck it, you know. Right. We're always looking for the fuck it, you yeah. know, and that's yeah. the ultimate for me. Yeah. So I I, I I moved out to San Diego and I started exploring new new realms of, of, of um, addiction, recovery, and um, this is where I found psychedelics. And let me just back up for a second. Just just as far as and this is just on my little philosophy as, as, around addiction, but you know the, the idea of sobriety. Um, to me, sobriety is more of a state of mind than a place that you actually get to. Because, I mean, whether you're drinking coffee, smoking cigarettes, whether you're eating food like carrots and celery and meat, all have different chemical compositions to it that that um, interact with our physiology and our neurology. Right. So ultimately. I feel like we're always in an altered state to a degree. Now, not all altered states are created equal, but the sure. idea of sober, like what is that really? To me, it's more of um, like, like, like sobriety is a, is a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's more of like a state of being than a place you actually arrive at. Well, you know, let's just say from a 12 step perspective, Sobriety is defined as you know freedom from mind-altering substances. Now that being said, it's obvious the obvious ones: alcohol, uh, pot, opiates, stimulants, <coughs> barbiturates, these kinds of things. But you know, back in the day, like in the '80s when I got sober, 
Uh, people were telling uh, uh, new members not to take um, antidepressants, for example, bipolar people. I've talked about this e extensively, but, you know, um, people were sitting there huffing down packs of cigarettes and, and coffee and sugar and uh, weren't very fit and weren't very mentally or spiritually fit. So, OK, yeah, we have to be careful when we talk like this, because for me in the addict mind, if I can, if I have too many, if I, if it's too loose for me to define recovery or sobriety for myself, then I can also say, and this is a very, very easy thing to slip on, that it's okay for me to, I don't know, um, take that extra pain pill, even though I'm kind of not feeling that sick, or maybe I can smoke some weed occasionally. And this is where it comes into what's your real definition of recovery. And here's a new idea. Look, I'm clean and sober. I don't take any drugs. Um, but the thing is that I have been on psychotropics. I have been on antidepressants. Um, I have done the plant medicine myself. Um, you know, I do have CBD. So from my perspective of defining my own recovery, when I've got like the big players out of the picture, like I'm smoke free. I don't feel sober if I'm huffing down cigarettes. I watch people. It's like, you're, a, you're like a junkie, man, with the nicotine, you know? But the thing is, I'm not going to get arrested. I'm not going to lose everything. I'm not going to wind up on the street probably for drinking too much coffee or, or smoking a, a, a cigarettes or whatever, right? Or, or what have you. So I kind of got to be firm, but yet really kind of rigid. It's difficult. It's complicated to define what recovery is. Um, how do you define it for you? Because I know what I define it as. It's not the same necessarily as what AA defines it as, but it's a lot closer than, say, um, um, uh, what, what's it called? Where they harm reduction. It's a lot closer to harm reduction. Where it's like I'm. I have less incidents of going to the ER this month because I'm using clean needles or whatever, and that's that's some progress. That's harm reduction. It's not an NA or AA sobriety, um, but it is less damage. But I'm more into the AA version, but still a little bit looser. Well, how do you define recovery for yourself when it comes to the the main substances and, and drugs and mm -hmm. alcohol and things like that? I, you know, I, I don't even like the word recovery. Yeah. I, I take that word off the table. And for me, what really works is healing. Mm. And I, I substitute recovery with healing. And what is healing to me? Healing is an ongoing relationship with self. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I'm always working on. It's something that's never going to end. Well, let me give, 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 give you a bottom line question. When's yeah. the last time you shot dope? Oh, man. Uh, probably about five years ago. It's interesting that you say probably about five years ago because if I were, if you asked me when's the last time I uh, smoked weed, December 4th, 1997, yeah. around noon. Do you know what I mean? And that's where we have a very specific thing when we come at it from a 12 step perspective. But do you smoke pot at all? I do. Smokes a little pot. Do you drink alcohol at all? On occasion. On occasion, but it's not a problem. It's not a problem for you. It's not something that drives you into back into the addiction. It doesn't drive me back into the addiction, but I do notice though that it's it's. I look at addiction more too, and this just helps me frame it for myself. Yeah. It's like an energy inside of us. It's this addictive energy. So, um, you know, through my my uh, my process, yeah, you know, I've never gone back to shooting heroin. I was shooting heroin for like six years. I was an opiate addict for you know right. over a decade and. Hardcore. I mean, you know, I was smoking crack. I mean, I was doing all types of. I was just, you know, uh, yeah. And 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 now, I mean, I, I gave myself a year completely sober. Um, also through the plant medicine work that I have gone through with um, things like ibogaine and and ayahuasca. Talk um, about the difference between those two for people who don't know. For example, I don't know about ibogaine. Okay, I, ibogaine is comes from a plant called aboga, which is from West Africa. Um, this in, these indigenous people called the Bwitis use iboga as a sacrament in their religion for rites of passage ceremonies and um, different healing um, ceremonies as well. Ayahuasca is also a sacrament used through uh, indigenous societies in South America, like Peru. Um, so they, they, they do have similarities in, 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 in that aspect, in the spiritual context, but um, the big, you know, the, the big difference, I guess I would say, between Ibogaine and Ayahuasca, things like these are, um, I, I, Ibogaine has this ability to really tap more 
in the internal self, I feel like this really deep sense of going inside of me, going inward, kind of tapping into that infinity mm. by going inside, where something like ayahuasca, I definitely feel this, um, this sense where I'm going more outside of myself mm. and tapping into that infinity outside of myself and that abundance. The big difference as far as it relates to addiction, Ibogaine has this component to it where it physiologically is able to go into a person's brain and work on particular receptor sites okay. that are associated with addiction, the serotonin, the dopamine, the opioid, acetylcholine receptor sites, and has this ability to replenish them. And are these backed up by evidence-based research, or uh, yes. these, these aren't just uh, hearsay that people to, like folk stories that people talk about in the community? So these are backed by evidence-based research. Um, unfortunately, Ibogaine is illegal in the state, so um, the funding that, that, that backs these, this type of research is very minimal compared to funding that backs pharmaceutical um, oh, sure. funded. So there is scientific research done also in different countries as well, but if Ibogaine was legal, um, the funding that would back research would be extraordinary and the depth of which we would be able to really extract what is going on and really be able to isolate certain mechanisms right. would be much greater than now. But yeah, th th this goes way beyond hearsay and anecdotal evidence. Right, right, cool. So, um, you know, I did, did you ever do the San Pedro? I had done San Pedro. Right, that's yes. right. You told me about it before I did mm -hmm. that trip. Well, I did the San Pedro back in June, and you know that's basically mescaline, right? Right. And you know when I was a kid, we talked about taking um, uh, peyote or mescaline as the more spiritual thing, and the acid and so forth was the more getting high thing. Although I never really saw any of these psychedelic experiences as anything but, and I didn't have words for it then, but. It, it was a soul journey for me always since I was a kid. But, you know, being com you know, clean and sober and going into an experience of taking something like this is for one thing, there's a stigma. For another thing, there's the fear, there's the voice inside your head that says, hey, am I using, am I blowing my sobriety? You know, I seriously had to look at my intention. I did this with shamans. I did it as part of an opening the four directions, a sacred ceremony, which took, I don't know, it was like 10, 12 hours. It was fucking brutal. It was not pleasurable. It was not getting high and escaping. I did not get any euphoria. I had hardcore work on very, very deep trauma. And I'm still working with it. It's really, really hard, the energy that came up from it. So I don't feel any doubt in my mind, but would I say to somebody who's new in AA, hey, you should probably go do a San Pedro? I don't think so. Maybe you got to think about this for 10 years or so, have some therapy, uh, work with your spiritual community, so forth. It's an individual thing. But I will say that is my experience. And I, I, went, I went into this approach as a clean and sober person with the intention of having a spiritual um, experience to deepen my healing. Because I don't feel healed at 21, I'm going to be 21 years sober in December. I don't feel healed, especially what I've been through in the past few years with addictive relationships. So I'm going to have to go into the deeper, deeper trauma, the deeper, like the guy said, the shaman said when we started, he goes, first we open the wounds of the family. That's where we started the trip with the drums going and the sun pounding and don't drink any water. And I'm going to sit there feeling the suffering. This is not a high. This is not, this is not smoke some weed and go play pinball. This is like 10 years of psychotherapy in one day. Yes. Um, and with that being said, there is a big difference between doing any of these medicines or drugs. And that's just it. It's, it, it's how we go about looking at these things. Am I taking this substance to get high? as a recreational drug, or am I looking at it as a medicine, something that I'm gonna be doing deep personal work on. Right. And intention, that brings us to intention, which right. I think makes or breaks the, 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 the beneficial aspects of doing these types of things, these types of modalities, is you know the work that's being done beforehand in preparation, and then also the integration work afterwards. Well, and beforehand, you have to change your diet for the ayahuasca, right? There is some people yeah. say a couple weeks and some people say as long as six weeks before. Talk about some of the things that you have to do in preparation for the for the uh, what we call the grandmother. Yeah, for 
As, as far as what we call the grandmother um, ayahuasca, um, you know, there there is a diet or a dieta that's that 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 a person engages in. Um, it's a little bit different when you're actually in the jungle doing the dieta as opposed to the West because there's a lot more variables in the West that we're not necessarily able to back away from. But basically, it's you know it's staying off of things like salt, sugar, refined foods, um, um, pork, red meat. Um, Things like this. I mean, technology. As much as you can cut that out. I mean, you get down to the jungle. It's 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 human interaction, mm. touch. I mean, it gets a little bit more intense. But you know, I I also think the dieta is also it's a it's a practice of devotion as mm. well. So, you know, it, it's you know the medicine. There are these these energetics to these different these different medicines that I do think have some sort of intelligence or energetic right. signature that they can pick up on the the type of devotion and the type of seriousness that we put into and respect that we put into the process. And these medicines will I've noticed will meet you halfway. Right. And I just want to pull it back real quick just as far as um you know what 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 these medicines have really been able to give me um in my process and my ability to maybe drink some wine now and smoke cannabis is this this you know really pinpointing why i became addicted in the first place and what i was using like things like heroin for and for me it was you know i was really able through my um, medicine experiences get visions of myself at like six or seven years old mm. really stir up repressed and and suppressed emotions and memories mm. that really pinpointed why i was um you know um using drugs and and what i was using them for and ultimately came for me it was just not being enough and and i think you know you, we can you not feeling enough me not being enough and me within yourself within myself and me needing these particular drugs to make myself feel more articulate and more engaged and more social and i feel like a lot of people have that 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 issue that are using they're using drugs for that issue but for me i was able to actually pinpoint the actual um the, the actual experiences and events in my past that led to me not feeling enough and you might not be able to even do that i've probably had 25 or more years of psychotherapy i've always i've always had a therapist and i don't think i've ever had that kind of and i guess you could lay on the couch and do some regression therapy or you can do various techniques or so forth so this sounds like kind of the same aim as you would get in psychotherapy but with the with the context of the ceremony the framework the intention and the medicine yeah. Did I leave anything out? No, no. I, and, and yeah, no, I think I think you nailed all of it. And for me, it was just, you know, being sober for a year, except for the, the plant medicines I engaged in, no drink, no alcohol, no sex, nothing like that. I was able to really get a feeling of love and, and admiration and acceptance of who I am and, you know, what I was here to do. And once I got to that point, it was like this energy, this, this thing was just released and I was like, you know what? I think I might be able to go back to somewhat of a normal lifestyle. And right. that's not to say, you know, I do notice like sometimes I, if I have a glass of wine or, you know, I, I notice a little rustling inside of me sometimes. And, you know, if I, if I smoke a little tobacco here or there, like that addictive energy comes up. But what I have now is an awareness of these, right. these, these, these um, inconsistencies pop up inside of me, this addictive energy. And I'm able to really like stomp it out before it becomes a problem and the more that i do that that to me is a mindfulness practice in and of right. itself too and so you know and this is just my path and i'm sure. not saying this is the right way to go about it for everybody that's the thing about addiction it's there's no one size fits all um, um path through it and there's a lot of different avenues out there and there's a lot of different deviations of what uh, addiction is. I mean, I think depression and anxiety are forms of addiction and have addictive undertones, mm. addictive to thought, addictions to the mind. Mm. I mean, we were talking about that just a little bit earlier. Mm. Um, you know, so there's the obvious ones, the hardcore addictions, the hard addictions like heroin and crack and, you know, the behavioral addictions like sex and gambling, the technology, the Facebook. But, you know, there's you know, there, there's a lot more out there. Addiction to thought and, 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 and depression and, you know, things like these I also look at as having, you know, maybe not having the same mechanisms of right. addiction that can be compared to other Well, you know, we talk about this in Buddhism and um, 
we're winding down on our time, but we're in Buddhism, you know, and this is also the, the, the sort of the foundation for me for another book with a, that I'm going to be actually getting contracted for called Compassionate Recovery, which I think we, we may have talked about when I first got the idea, but the idea being that, you know, you have on one hand, you have subtle addictions or attachments, what Buddha called attachment, yeah. which is the root of suffering. And then you have the ad attachment gone wild, which are these full blown addictions that we're all familiar with. But um, you can't really deal with the subtle if you're drunk and smacked out or whatever yeah. you're like getting in jail and living on the street and all this, you know, uh, kind of clawing to survive and, 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 you know, being a crackhead. You're not really going to be able to sit in stillness and, and deal with the more subtle. So we kind of got to deal with the gross uh, uh, aspects first. And then we can get into the deeper, 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 subtle, you know, the uh, flux, the, what Patanjali, the uh, great yoga sage called the subtle fluctuations of the mind. You know, these are the things that we want to calm. So, yeah, there is a spectrum. And I believe that there's a spectrum of attachment and there's a spectrum also of recovery and mm -hmm. ways of, of being in healing. Um, let me ask you this uh, as we wind down. What... Um, for the ayahuasca, what to, so people don't do this like, oh, I'm going to take some ayahuasca and sit at home. I mean, people, you do it as a group, you do it with a leader. Um, but I've heard that there are, actually, I've been warned by some of the ayahuasca uh, community that people are dying, that there's a lot of, of, of fake shamans out there, people that are sort of think they are, but they're not, and, and they're just making money off this. So what kind of... What can you speak, say about that for anyone who is interested in experimenting on this plant medicine path? How to be careful and what to look for and ways to know that you're that you're doing the right thing? Um, yeah, a couple things I'd like to I guess speak on to that. There are definitely, especially in Southern California, just this idea of like the fake shaman and how much damage that can actually do to somebody that's in this really vulnerable, um, energetically open space when right. they're in this this psychedelic realm and. First off, it's 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 not it's not just jumping at the first the first sign of like oh I can do ayahuasca. I mean it's it's something that you know it's it's something you feel like you you feel called to do it. You know you you're patient with it. You know it's it's talking to people that you might not you might know have access or experience in, in these realms and asking them like what their experience is and asking them who they might recommend. Right. You know just it's like not I just with, just like jump, I did with you. Yeah and 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 like. Like anything, it's, you know, I don't want to make it sound like these plant medicines are like this cure-all because they are not that by any means. Any stretch of the imagination, the work has to be done. I mean, you know, I, what I do is I, I work as, a, as an addictions and integration um, coach. I work with people that are looking to seek um, 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 psychedelic modalities mm. for their addictions and for their depression and their anxieties. I work for a company called Being True to You. It's a US based company that, you know, we we work um, work with people that are going to different Ibogaine centers or different um, ayahuasca centers in Peru that are looking to do ketamine therapy, all of these types of new modalities that are popping up in the psychedelic realms. And, you know, we work with people and help them prepare for it and then also help them with the integration afterwards, right. the, the extraction of the things that come up and the insights that come through during these experiences and mm -hmm. helping them practically apply it to their day-to-day -day life. And there's this process, especially the process of an integration and the work that done, that's done after can take months. Mm -hmm months and months i mean it's 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 work and and you know there, there's no there's no easy way out of addiction it's this you know these plant medicines offer an alternative doorway through um through their addiction that they might not have been getting through things like 12 steps and it just offers a different avenue which i think the more avenues the better but i think the big takeaway is no matter what avenue you go through, whether it's 12 steps or smart recovery or refuge recovery or plant medicines, I mean, first off, like, you, you, you got to want to stop. Mm -hmm. You got to want to stop and you got to be ready to do the work. Mm -hmm. And and those are, you know, those are like the two huge foundational um, um, structures that really have to hold you up and right. support you through through your path. That's the same. That there's no argument there when you walk into the door of a treatment center, uh, when you get pre-screened for an interview to go into detox. 
or you know uh, any other place that I've ever heard of real. So I think that's a great stopping point. Um, is there anything else? Uh, would you like people to be able to get in touch with you? If so, how would they? Or is there anything else uh, left unsaid? I know those, we could talk about this obviously for hours. <laughs> Um, it is time-based, so it doesn't matter if you have an event coming up because it won't probably be out in time. But w what would you like to say to conclude? And, and if you'd like people to get in touch with you, please uh, let them know how. Yeah, so I work for a company called Being True to You. We are an addiction and psychedelic integration coaching company. And beingtruetoyou.com is the website. Um, beingtruetoyou.com. And... You can find me on that website. You can email me at tyler at beingtruetoyou.com. There's another way to get a hold of me through email. Um, yeah, yeah. It's the, those are, would be the two avenues that uh, one would be able to, to reach out. And also, if you wanted to just um, message in to the 12-step Buddha, Buddha, Buddhist, I'm sorry, the 12-step Buddhist, um, you know, I'm sure Darren can also... Um, yeah, my, all my, my information is always out there. Can point you in the right direction as well if you want to get in touch with me. Fantastic. Well, I really appreciate the conversation. I learned a lot in a short time. I try to keep these down to 20, 30 minutes just because people are busy and put them into bite-sized jokes. But maybe we can continue the discussion as, as, we, uh, as we go. Thanks very much, Tyler. Thank you, Darren. <laughs>